Accutron Watches present. From New York City, this is the Accutron Show, a time travel through American culture with your hosts, Bill McCuddy, Scott Alexander, and David Graver. Visit AccutronWatch.com and discover the brand that has made American history with an all-new proprietary next-generation electrostatic energy movement. Accutron. It's not a timepiece. It's a conversation piece. What we wanted to do is complete, create something completely unique for Accutron. So Hudson's really known for single grain varieties. So we're 95% rye, 95% corn for our base core range. Uh, and what I did is created actually blends for Accutron, which is something that Hudson does not do out in the market. We are excited. As you can probably gather, we are talking to some of the greatest minds on cigars and whiskey, bourbon, and everything spiritual. Uh, our <laughs> guests are Brendan O'Rourke. He is the site leader of Tuffletown Distillery, the makers of Hudson Whiskey. Also, Sam Phillips. He's the president and co-owner of La Polina Cigars. And Nate Ghana. He's the founder of Beverage and the owner of Whiskey Live USA and Canada. They are all with us. But first up, me, Bill McCuddy, along with Scott Alexander and editor David Graver. All that and more on this very exciting, and we'll tell you why, episode of the Accutron Show. Stay tuned. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, accutronwatch.com, and discover our iconic Space View 2020 collection, recreating the stunning visual impact of the original open dial design combined with an all new electrostatic energy movement. Time just changed again. The Accutron Space View 2020. Gentlemen, I'm feeling thirsty. <laughs> I wonder why. This is uh, a, a it's pretty. It's crazy why, Bill. <laughs> yes, that's right. And it's five o'clock somewhere. I'm so sorry to that, but it works. Um, we are talking about whiskey, bourbon, uh, some very special ones, and uh, cigars on this edition. Uh, get to the bad part. There really is no bad news today, is there, David? <laughs> no, we've got an expert. We've got a digital expert. We've got three experts, actually. And uh, we are celebrating, by the way, in October, the uh, Accutron's birthday and the year that Accutron turned 62. 62. Wow. Yeah. Two of the three people on this panel are younger <laughs> than Accutron, and the one you're listening to is older. Uh, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> we have enjoyed being part of the Accutron show for three seasons now, and we're getting excited about a, a birthday celebration that happens for them uh, in October. Uh, in the meantime, we are sort of celebrating a little early with these three guests. I'm going to ask them and ask you first, what is it about smoking a cigar and drinking probably something brown that is almost the best thing on, yeah, I on think the it's planet? About stepping out of your normal time, stepping out of your day to day. If you go into the bar, if you're on your back porch, if you're with friends, there's a, there's a fellowship that for me, that's what it is all about. It's about the fellowship of sharing a smoke and sharing a drink and Time well spent. That's right. If Accutron was saying something about it, probably. David? <laughs> They're also both, for lack of a better word, hobbies that the more informed you get, the more interested you can be. The more you know about a whiskey, the more you care about a whiskey, the more you know about a cigar and what is an, an exemplary cigar experience, the more you want to pursue that experience. So. And the more you dive. get out of it, I mean, the more you get out of each thing, as, you, as your understanding kind of grows, you, your palate gets more sophisticated. Um, there's times when I've done tastings where you, you f can feel yourself by the end, you can taste different things, even over an hour. Like if you taste 10 different whiskeys, or I had one sake tasting I went to that was, um, I tasted probably 80 sakes. And at the beginning, I was like, oh, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. But then I was like, that has this no slight note of tangerine. I wonder if Nate, uh, and we'll ask him, actually doesn't mix it up. I wonder if he just drinks one thing when he's going out and tasting or if he has the ability or he probably has to for his job. He's well, trying a sake and then he's having a bourbon and then he's having a scotch. That's a, that's a tough combo, the sake. The sake <laughs> yeah, to, the, well, the, the you just can't hangover. taste sake after you taste whiskey. Yeah. It really does vary on what, I mean, depends on what you're going for. If I am doing a comparative tasting of scotch, clearly there's only scotch, but if I'm doing a comparative whiskey tasting where I'm trying to help people understand the difference between a bourbon, a rye, a single malt scotch, and a Japanese whiskey, it's good to try them together. Oh, those Japanese whiskeys, though. Mmm, man. <laughs> I, it's, I was somehow late to that party about five years ago is when I first really discovered them, and jeez, man. 
Well, there's really a lot to stuff. discover now, too. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing. Both of those categories have exploded, both cigars and spirits, to the point where it's very intimidating. I mean, I, it took me years to learn anything about wine, and, and now I feel like uh, I got more. I have Japanese. I have uh, – There's. I think there's bourbon and scotch coming from India. You have to and, keep up with the rocks, you know, liquor brands. <laughs> and, and the celebrities that are, right. are behind them and selling them for a billion dollars. Uh, listen, what do you get the 60-plus-year-old on their birthday that has had everything? For Accutron, it's the Empire State Building where they're headquartered. It's going to be lit up in Accutron Green on October mm. 25th. Nice. There is also, uh, as we mentioned, a new special Accutron X Hudson Whiskey Blend and a special Accutron Space View 2020 timepiece that comes in a humidor. You are uh, unable to see the... Uh, little cigar from Accutron and La Polina that I'm holding up. That means you're not watching us on YouTube. Be sure and follow us there and subscribe. Thank you for that. And uh, we will have a great show uh, celebrating and with a few announcements when we return right after this. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, AccutronWatch.com, and discover our Accutron DNA collection. Reimagined for a new generation, the Accutron DNA combines breakthrough technology, precise engineering, and modern aesthetics to achieve a new level of technical excellence. The Accutron DNA, the new face of time for those who blaze new trails. Gentlemen, welcome to the Accutron Show. It is our birthday, and we're celebrating the only way we know how uh, with cigars and hooch. Yay! <laughs> yeah, we're, we're pretty excited. And uh, we have three amazing people to talk to about that. Uh, I want to. Oh, so I'm okay. I mean, I'm okay. <laughs> no, I meant our guests, yeah. but thank you very much. Um, Sam, uh, let's begin with you. What is it that makes a cigar pair so well with spirits? Well, I'll tell you, Mr. McCuddy, we've shared quite a few cigars in New York. <laughs> yes, we have. And, uh, you know, for me personally, uh, I like to pair opposite of the whiskey or the bourbon that I'm I'm drinking. So if I've got a heavy Lagavulin and it's peaty and it's rich and at the same time elegant, I want to mm. pair a cigar that's lighter, creamier, buttery and smooth so that they complement one another. Because if you pair a rich, full-bodied cigar with a full-bodied whiskey, they're battling themselves. So I think right. if you're looking for synchronicity between the whiskey that you're drinking and the cigar that you're smoking, that's always been the way that I do it. You want a soprano and a baritone. <laughs> two baritones in a room, you know. We'll talk about the specific cigar that you guys blended for Accutron in Get this, it comes in a humidor with a special watch, uh, but you're actually buying the cigars. You just get the watch for free. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but before we do that, uh, I, I want to switch gears and talk to uh, our other guest about what what you look for in in a good whiskey or bourbon. What's the criteria? What do you when you go and taste one, uh, what should people listening to this or watching this uh kind of be on the lookout or taste bud wise so this is a, a pretty subjective question you're throwing through into me um because everybody's palate is going to be completely different um so everyone's nose is different everyone's palate's different male versus female your palate's going to perceive things differently but to me when i'm going in and i'm tasting whiskey what i look for is balance because I, I want everything to you know work together. I don't want there to be like a singular spike in a particular flavor, um, because to me that throws off your experience. Uh, if you're going in to taste a whiskey and you know all you're getting is you know sweet vanilla right up front and you can't get anything beyond that, uh, I, I really don't feel like you've achieved a, a proper blend uh, for your product. Brendan. You're rolling off of a very successful release of an Accutron edition Hudson whiskey, and there's another one um, coming down the down the chute. I'm wondering if you can tell me what it was like to select and put this new product out, and how it's different than the previous release. Yep. So the the first project that we worked on with Accutron was just a single barrel release, uh, and that was to celebrate the 60th anniversary. Or, and you know, it was. What I was trying to do with that one was really showcase what rye can do and have, you know, different flavors out there, just individual casts of rye. Uh, for this next project that I'm working on, 
uh, what we wanted to do is complete create something completely unique for Accutron. So Hudson's really known for single grain varieties. So we're 95% rye, 95% corn for our base core range. Uh, and what I did is created actually blends for Accutron, which is something that Hudson does not do in mm. out in the market. So I wanted something unique and special for Accutron. Uh, and what I did is created three different bourbon blends and three different rye blends, uh, ranging from high rye to low rye and a high bourbon to low bourbon, just in terms of the blend of the products. Uh, and we tasted through them and it was a battle to try to figure out which one everyone wanted uh, because everyone was in love with the products. Uh, and then after we did figure out a winner uh, and we're going with uh, a bourbon that is uh, a pretty middle of the road rye blend into it, uh, I did an experimental run for them where I actually put together uh, blends that you would never see coming out of the distillery just for fun for them, uh, blending together, you know, some of our peated liquid into our bourbon, uh, just to have mm. some fun and really showcase what the distillery can do. And I know you worked with Nate through the selection process. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what that was like? Uh, working with Nate was extremely fun. Um, so he, he really knows his stuff. So really when you're putting liquid in front of him, you get a little intimidated. Um, you know, I, I have a, a culinary background, so you know I like that in, instant gratification of giving somebody a product that they're going to taste, um, and having Nate go through and you know taste all the liquids that we've done um, was a really humbling experience when he walks out of the distillery and said that he had a phenomenal time and was loving all the liquid. You mentioned uh, a peated product coming out of uh, Tuttletown. Are you guys doing uh, malted a, a malted whiskey at all, or are you, are you playing around with that? Uh, so this one is our first uh, project that we did once the acquisition from William Grant occurred. Uh, so what we're doing is a cask finish of rye in Elsa Bay casks. So they are a peated scotch uh, that we are then finishing rye whiskey in those casks. And the cask originally came from Tuttletown. Uh, so it's a Hudson. Oh, that's amazing. It made the round trip. <laughs> yeah. Lots of miles on those barrels. So they ended up leaving the distillery right when I first started and came back for me to do this as a, a project. That's amazing. So all the all the peat is coming from the barrel. All the peat is coming from the barrel and you you can pick it up right off the bat. It is a, a very strong peated note, but what we tried to do is make sure that you could actually taste the rye along with the peat. Brennan, uh, Hudson is an incredible survivor. We talk about American companies on the Accutron show, and you guys burned to the ground and then rebuilt. Uh, how did you do during the pandemic? Did we did we drink more bourbon and rye uh, when we were sitting at home, uh, or were sales off? What happened? Uh, so during the pandemic, you know, we we didn't see the same amount of sales that we would have loved to see through bars and restaurants. Just nature of you know the pandemic uh but sales were good you know people are drinking at home you know it's a, it's one of these industries that are a bit recession proof and i guess pandemic proof uh, because you right. need something to uh to really round out your day uh and we're seeing we were seeing great sales and as soon as we had the visitor center back open for limited tours on the outside everybody from the city is coming up they want to ex experience our property and really have a, a cocktail out in front of the fire pit. Nate, I'm very curious uh, to know, is whiskey drinking for you an active experience or a passive experience? Is it something that you're doing along with other things or do you take a, like, a large percentage of your time to savor the whiskey that's in front of you? That's a, a very great and complex question. Um, I think at this point, it's really a mindset. Uh, Depending on where I am, which country I'm at, I'm, I'm currently on a seven-week tour. Um, depending on which country I'm in, uh, my mindset will change as to what I'm tasting. Uh, because there's no such thing as bourbon in Scotland, and there's no such thing as scotch in America. So, you know, the markets are extremely heavily focused to a specific type of liquor. So a lot of brands in scotch whiskey don't have the same success that bourbon does have in, in America. Um, and, and Brennan can probably agree with me, you know, um, rye and, and bourbon are, are the primary whiskeys in America. And I'm saying that from a perspective that American single malt is now a very new category that's about to be legalized. 
and still it's it's finding a very tough way to market. Uh, we are so dominant in the mindset of, of marketing bourbon and rye that when you are in a specific city or state or country even, you take to heart where you are and, and how you're tasting. So uh, I put my mind to the glass that I have in hand, but I definitely see that right now when I'm doing a, a tasting, I'm definitely not doing a bourbon and a scotch in the same panel anymore that I used mm-hmm. to do. Um, now I'm doing solely scotches, solely bourbons or, or rye, um, and then American single malts will be grouped in the same category as scotch whiskey. So really I've started to understand the market more. And, and that's kind of where my shift has been is just the understanding, like going out to see what, what Brandon is doing in, in New York is absolutely phenomenal. And also I think that it speaks to a, another level of it. You're not in New York city when you're there, you are in a, it's almost as if you're not even in New York, you know, you're going out there and it's, it's this amazing, incredible land that happens to have a fantastic distillery on it, but you're thinking, wow, how is this New York? And I'm really trying to put my mindset into where the production is. Right. And I guess that's probably my point is I'm, I'm taking each individual that's behind a brand and I'm, I'm bringing myself to that person and what they've done, what they've created. That'd probably be my best answer for you. Nate, I'm still, and I think everyone listening is grappling with the fact that you're on a seven-week tour doing nothing but tasting scotches and bourbons. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's got to be the best job on the planet. I am honestly uh, the happiest camper on earth. Uh, it, it's been quite unique. You know, we went to uh, Dalmore, and this is about three weeks ago. And it's funny because all these tours are set up in a specific way. And, and in Scotland, they haven't had people come in for three years now, really almost, almost, almost three, essentially. And uh, they've now just started getting tours back, but only for press and and not to the public. And so they said, you know, we have a really special day for you. We're going to take you to have a picnic at the place where the water is uh, sourced for Dalmore. So we did our, our tour of the distillery. It was closed to everybody else. We get there and they said, yep, lunch is in 10 minutes. So it's now 1210 lunch is at 1220. Great. We wind up in a sprinter van and we're going through back roads. We have no service. Back roads are full of potholes and and we're in a sprinter van, the least efficient van on planet earth to go through. (laughs) So we're now 70 minutes into a 10 minute uh, trail for lunch. We're all extremely furious at each other thinking like, why didn't we just eat beforehand? And all of a sudden the trees disappear and emerges this castle and we're, we're thinking, okay, none of us are hungry. None of us are upset anymore. And we get there and it is this 500 acre incredible land owned by this Laird who wound up being you know, a billionaire that sold a bunch of companies and purchased this land. And it's a sort of a wildlife conservation area. But he says, you know, as he's taking us in his, in his Land Rover, which is what's really needed to get you through those lands there. He says, you know, and here are the two Sam's they're going to be taking you through the boating and the the shooting. And I literally turned to Dalmore and I said, guys, what did you do? And and they said, we actually didn't even do anything. We don't even know what's going on right now. And so the Dalmore people didn't even set this up. Like a well-oiled machine. Stillery wanted to make a very special impact on us. And she set up this phenomenal boat tour with, with clay pigeon shooting and that really is Scotland in a nutshell, right? So now you're embracing the land and you're sitting there thinking like, wow, now I can get into the zone of, of focusing and tasting what was meant to be. And you're on the river that's actually producing the water that you're, you're drinking, you know, that, that beautiful whiskey. And so every land has a different story, right? And, and you know, that, the same thing can apply to, to Brendan. And, you know, I fell in love with the two cats on Brendan's property. Uh, can't get over them. Absolutely. You know, can you taste the cats in the whiskey? <laughs> Depends on what he's doing. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I think it's one of those things right now where, uh, it's just such a unique opportunity and, and everybody's got to have their leg up on, in this industry right now. I was, I was saying this the other day, if you don't have, if, if you want to try and get premium shelf space, you better be making a damn good product because if you're not, you are not getting into that total wine. You are not getting anywhere near it. In fact, so yeah, I was I was actually wanted to ask you about that. There, it seems like in recent years, you know, you go back twenty years or so, and the liquor industry was a lot simpler. It seems like, um, and you look at something like wine, and there's this proliferation. It's very hard to become an, a true expert across all of wine because there's so many different. But I'm trying. 
But uh, but with liquor it was a lot simpler. There were a few, only a few premium brands in each category, and you could understand them. It seems like in the last ten years, twenty years, but really ten and five years, there's been this unbelievable proliferation of brands. Do you do you see that happening from your side? Absolutely, and that's a great point because yes, you're you're probably more correct in saying five years. So mm -hmm. the one thing that's gone on that's fantastic, and and while I say this, and I did just say that you know they do separate country very very much. You know both countries are very proud of what they produce. However, right now I would say that Scotch whiskey is in a tough position versus bourbon or rye. Uh, Scotch whiskey, a lot of brands have relied on their name, have taken down the quality of what they've produced. And when I say that, they've added more water. I won't name names to any brands, but there is a, a specific 25-year that was in the market at a 48% ABV, and then they recently cut down to 43. Um, with, <clears throat> with bourbon and rye, you'd be hard-pressed to find a company that wants to cut, if not raise their, their <laughs> level, right? Uh, yeah. Nine. That's the American way. Tasks make, make it stronger. Yeah. <laughs> More. Actually insane because you're talking about one out of every maybe 100 bottles that's cask strength and scotch whiskey. You're talking about 90 out of every 100 in, in bourbon and rye being cask strength just naturally. doesn't have to be a limited edition, just how the market is. And I think that's forced scotch whiskey to have to up their game because America doesn't put anything forward that they don't believe in. And they don't like to make anything subpar. So when you're involved with that, and that's only happened in the last five years, like you were saying. So now you've got this case where Scotch whiskey is also losing ground as a whole because everybody is seeing just how effective bourbon truly is and giving you, you know, you don't have to have a 74% heater or bomb every single time. But, you know, when we're talking about 56 to 58, that's a sweet spot for, for bourbon and rye and quite frankly, Scotch whiskey. Um, but when you're taking things down, brands are and, and charging more, people are not dumb. You know, people are very aware of what they're purchasing nowadays. And, and now you see brands doing this. And I think Scotch whiskey is going to kick themselves real hard very quickly here. They're not trying to create like a session whiskey or something, are they? No, no, exactly. And, and it's, it's literally like that. Like it's right. it's very strange to me that this is how they've chosen to approach the market, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but Nate, we did see what I would call the proof wars in the beginning where everything was just a little stronger and a little stronger. Have we sort of backed off of that? You know, we we have, but we we also haven't. Um, there's a brand, the Bowman brand. And uh, I mean, Brandon can probably agree with me here. I mean, Bowman has everything from 68 to 76. And you're thinking like, Wow. Holy smokes, you know, and that lies under the same portfolios in, in, in Buffalo Trace as, as a Blanton's, which is, you know, sitting at 46 to 48. That just shows that that one portfolio has a varied range of whatever you want, which is even worse. It's even scarier, right? Because one brand has that many sub brands and they can get you that sweet spot. You're going to stick with them, right? So you start seeing these things and you're like, oh, uh, something's going to happen and it's not going to be for the better of Scotch whiskey. And, and Asia is the same way. Asia with Cavalan in, in Taiwan has done a phenomenal job. There's almost very few Cavalan whiskeys that are below 46. Uh, most are in the 59 to 64 range. So you're thinking, okay, they've got it right. And they've got their Asian twist to it. So even then it, it's a tough market. And so I think if they, Scotch whiskey actually wants to keep up, they're going to have to raise their portfolio and their value offer just like bourbon has bourbon's never wavered in their value offer they've just gotten you know they've they've gotten savvy to the fact that people are buying scotch whiskeys for obscene amounts of money but you know they also still make the product that is like this this is a 50 percent bottled and bond at 52 dollars i mean if you can beat that in scotch whiskey right now i mean i've heard lafroy 10 has gone through the roof price wise that's not even an affordable brand anymore of the top 10. Nate, for people listening to this, tell us what you just held up and showed us. Yeah. So this is the Hirsch Bivouac. This is a brand new bottling that was just released. It is 50% bottle and bond. It's got a 95% blend of three year and a 5% blend of eight. That older depth in bourbon is going to add the backbone and then everything else is going to add the, the foreground to that whiskey. Uh, but if you have that at $52 and you've got a Lafroy 10 sitting at $70, you know, there's no comparison there, right? And, and that's in the minds of the consumer and it's true. So it's a tough market right now. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, accutronwatch.com and discover our legacy collection. 
reviving some of the most memorable Accutron watches from the 60s and 70s, the Legacy Collection combines timeless design with the technical excellence of Swiss watchmaking, each limited to 600 individually numbered pieces. The Accutron Legacy Collection, inspired by the past, built for the future. <laughs> Sam, I touched upon this with Nate a little bit, and I'm curious to know your thoughts with regard to cigars. Is cigar smoking for you an active pleasure or a passive pleasure? Is it the activity or does it accompany the activity? That's a great question. I, I think that much like Nate's response, it's where I am and what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm heading down on Sunday to Nicaragua, and I haven't been down there in about, in about a, a year uh, because American Airlines and most of the majors are not flying down there. Um, but for me, I'll be playing with blends all week long. And so I'm in that moment. And so when I'm in that moment and I'm working and I'm blending, that entire week for me changes. I stay at a very specific hotel and I completely immerse myself and focus on those tobaccos and how they're performing from year to year. And what happens with us is, is very similar to wine. So whatever the climate, microclimate is, right now we're having a very, very wet season. So the tobacco performs differently. So if, you, if you're drinking a bottle of Tignanello from 2015, nobody's going to, nobody's going to um, try to word this the right way. COVID hit me hard. <laughs> but basically, if you, if you are consuming Tignanello from 2015, you're never going to expect that the 2018 is going to perform like the 2015. And in the cigar and in the cigar business, that's what our end consumer expects. They're looking for the consistency that Brendan is able to provide. We're not able to provide that. And we're not able to provide that because the tobacco changes from year to year. So for me, to answer your question long-winded, I, I am much more, I think, active than I am passive because I've been working with tobacco for so long. And the tobacco is, is or the cigars are actually the opposite of what they're trying to accomplish with a whiskey. The cigar has to change. It has to keep you interested. There's got to be a level of complexity, and that's what we strive for year after year. And so we're trying to, con to, to, to have a consistent product year after year, but there's always going to be subtle variants. Right. So you're kind of tasting actively so everyone else can taste <laughs> yeah, passively good. in a way. Yeah, that's you know, right. You, you make sure that like whenever you're enjoying your conversation that the cigar is, is amazing, but that's because you're paying very close attention. <laughs> yeah, and I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm truly, truly humbled when – a gentleman like Nate Ghana, who's got, I think, 127,000 followers on Instagram, that he's in love with La Polina, the white label specifically. And I know he's a huge fan of the, the Accutron blend as well that we made out of our sister uh, manufacturing partner here in Little Havana, Miami, El Titan de Bronze. And he, he likens that cigar and compares it to a Padron. Very good friends of mine. And when you talk about the apex of cigar smoking, you know, Padron or Opus X, those are typically blends that are out there that are unrivaled in the marketplace because of their popularity. So I'm very proud that, you know, somebody of Nate's caliber is that much a fan of, of La Polina. It's very humbling. Well, Sam, since you brought up calibers, let's talk about the watch that uh, has been designed. We are spending this episode sort of talking with our, our strategic partners about Accutron more than we normally do, because not just because it's their birthday, but as you mentioned, some of the people we've been able to put together over the years are big fans of each other, as is evidenced by this uh, podcast today. So what, what can you tell us about the limited edition timepiece and the cigar that comes with it that you and I are both holding up now. Absolutely. So, uh, Mr. McCuddy, there's a couple of things. The humidor that we created to go along with the release of the timepiece is very, very special. We have a woodworking factory in Nicaragua. And when we met with the marketing team and the senior left level executives, Michael Benevente and Jeffrey Cohn, they wanted authenticity. So we went to our woodworking factory and said, what are the ages of the Spanish cedar that we have? We need to create 222 unique humidors to go along with 222 unique timepieces. So we have a humidor that is created in Nicaragua, and it is 10-year-aged Spanish cedar. And when we made this, it was very important for us to have a secondary drawer for your accessories, because what do guys do? When you sit down at your desk for the day, typically you'll take your timepiece off because you don't want to scratch the bottom of the timepiece. So you, you can take your timepiece, 
put it in the humidor, close it, and then it, it, it works on your desk as a placeholder for your timepiece as well as your cigars. So when they, when they presented the opportunity to do 222 unique pieces, we jumped on top of it. And Donnell and the art department, Michael Benevente and Gael, made an amazing tobacco brown finish in this space view and uh, tobacco brown specific uh, watch band. And I just think they knocked it out of the park. And they, and when we started to play with this, it was, do we take the staple of La Polina, do we put Goldie on the front of the band? And uh, Bill and Clay and I actually took a step back and said, you know what? We've seen this done before. There, this, is, this is nothing new to have a cigar that's limited edition and a watch that's limited edition. So how do we do it and how do we do it the right way? And what we did is we focused on color schemes and we wanted the watch to be just the watch. We did not want it to say La Polina on the front of the watch. We did mm. not want to have Goldie on the front of the watch. So what we did is we took the case back and it says La Polina and Accutron and it's one of 222, two of 222, three of 222. And I just, I think that they knocked it out of the park. It's absolutely amazing. And so you wear yours inside out, right? So that the La Polina <laughs> is on the outside. Um, this, is, this is an incredible collaboration. And I'm not just saying that because we work for the company. It's a really cool watch. I think the pe people listening to this, the easiest way to describe it is that everything on a space view that's green on the normal one is brown on this one. And it really looks cool. I mean, I have to say, it is five thousand uh, dollars. But that uh, we were talking to the folks at Accutron, and the they were saying the humid the humidor was worth like two grand. So, and I, the cigars are expensive, are relatively expensive. I know. So this is, in, as far as a value is concerned, as you said, there are only two hundred and twenty-two of them. So it's pretty cool, and I hope that they become as collectible as uh, as a lot of the older Accutrons have become. I love that relationship also between. Uh, cigars and timekeeping, and also, you know, whiskey goes in this category too. Where when you smoke a cigar, you're really taking time out. You're really like setting. You're really consciously aware of like I'm not going to do other things. I'm going right. to. It's that active enjoyment, uh, David, that you were talking about a little there's bit. There's a notion of being a ritual, um, a ritualistic. Do you feel like there's a almost a return? It feels like people are a little exhausted, maybe by all by social media and the constant constraints of work and everything else, and that. Do you feel a, a return back to that desire for time out, time consciously set aside? Yeah, well, I, absolutely. And, you know, we were actually the opposite uh, of, of what happened to Brendan's business uh, because uh, most of the liquor stores that are out there are deemed essential businesses. We never we never shut down. We we ne we never did because we were deemed an essential business because we supply liquor stores. For us specifically, we've had a, a tremendous micro boom. You know, we had the huge cigar boom in 95, 96, and 97. Mm -hmm. And for us, we've now had a mini boom. So cigar smoking, cigar imports, everything's risen exponentially, not just the imports, tobacco, et cetera, et cetera. Uh -huh. And so I think that what we found on, on our side is people are smoking more. And I think that what's happened is, again, we're the opposite of what you would find in scotch whiskey, in bourbon, or in rye because that provides a, a level of tranquility, right? You're sipping, okay, the alcohol sets in, you're nice, you're mellow. And I think that for men more than women, it's very, very difficult for us to find that meditative state. And that's what the cigar provides. If you go and you power down a cigar, it's gonna knock you on your ass. Right. If you take the time to enjoy that cigar, it's actually been said and proven by a couple of case studies that this will actually lower your blood pressure. You know, for, mm. for, for women, there's yoga, there's meditation, for guys after a hard day where they can go out onto the porch or in their man cave and they can take an hour or 45 minutes of their time, smoke the cigar, what it's going to provide is tranquility, mellow tranquility. It's very, very hard for gentlemen to get into that state. Well, you look pretty mellow there. People who are listening to this uh, don't. I'm going to have them. And by the way, thanks for subscribing and following us on YouTube. You really should jump to uh, the YouTube version of this and see. Uh, <laughs> Sam is like in Archer's lair there. He's like uh, in kind of a. Uh, you you're in a very relaxed room. We should say. We're ensconced. Yeah. Where are you? So this is our. We actually built a set in one of our warehouses here in Naples, Florida. Um, we actually built two studios, 
And what we did, because <laughs> when everything shut down for the first month to month and a half, we didn't know what was going to happen to our brick and mortar retail partners. Uh -huh. So myself and Clay and Bill sat down. Bill obviously coming from the the, the media business with Columbia Broadcast, CBS Television. Right. We talked about him in, in the last time you were on the show. Yep. Well, I don't know if I talked about my other business partner, Clay. His father created Charlie's Angels. He was a part of Mission, mm. Mission Impossible. He is a true 21-year producer out of Hollywood. So I said to him, I'm okay in front of the camera. You're really good in front of the camera. How do we, how do we help our brick-and-mortar retail partners, our brothers-in-arms, that are, that are shut down right now? So we created a program called the Cigar Lockdown. The philosophy behind me was eat, drink, smoke are my three great passions. So you haven't left that room for like three years? I've just been here. It's incredible. That's impressive. I get up. Well, I like the beard. <laughs> well, I mean that, right? So I went full COVID. I, I grew the hair long as long as I have it. And, um, and I grew a beard. That's yeah, a different look. Um, I have a question that sort of unites both the, the liquor industry and cigars. Both of these industries are predicated on tradition and craftsmanship and heritage. What role do you find innovation and future forward technology is playing? Uh, Brendan, you want to take it and then I'll, I'll dovetail. Sure. Um, so for me, uh, new technology and innovations coming in is really just to improve how the operations functions. Um, so if you think about whiskey production, it uses a lot of water, it uses a lot of energy. Uh, and really what it's going to come down to is making whiskey the right way that's better for the environment. Uh, so we're trying to use new technology to cut down on water usage, on prepping barrels. Uh, we're using cooling towers to cut down on our well water usage for cooling our liquids. Uh, so all of that's just going to make whiskey that's better for the environment and better for everyone in the world. I love that. From my side, um, we're as old school as old school could be. Uh, technologically, I think that the only thing, the only variance that you would see since the beginning of the beginning of time and where we are today is the fermentation process. There have been uh, different processes dependent upon our manufacturing <clears throat> partners in the way that they ferment that tobacco. So you have the traditional old school system of here's some gas heaters, we run them up in the uh, up in the tobacco barns to create the fermentation process that moves a little bit quicker or you can just do it completely old school where they hang the tobacco and it's completely climate based. And then the third option was, uh, I believe invented by our partners, the Placencia is the largest growers of Cuban seed tobacco in the world. And they have a Caltrisa system. So that's basically um, a heated air conditioning system that cycles the air. We'll cycle it over and over and over again. And they set a very specific temperature and humidity and they're able to ferment tobacco at a higher pace, similar to what Nate was saying. Um, hmm. And where is that happening? We were Nate was talking about uh, Cuban cigars. You are you are making these cigars where? We make so La Polina is a, a very interesting a very interesting company, and I don't, I don't want to like like go off on a tangent here, but we're we're 126 years old, born in 1896. So for us, we are now making our cigars in Nicaragua, Honduras, the Dominican Republic, and in Little Havana, Miami. Are those all puros, or are they blending? Say it again, Bill. I lost. You. Are those all puro cigars, or are you from each of those countries, or are you blending them? So, uh, well, they're they're both. I mean, we're always so. I, I head down, like I said on Sunday, to Nicaragua, and I have four different factories in Nicaragua that we work with that we will be visiting, and they're all different. So we do have a factory that makes several Nicaraguan puros for us that are part of our innovation portfolio, and the majority of our cigars are not going to be puros. We're taking cigar tobacco from Honduras. We're taking tobacco from the three regions uh, where we grow and process in Nicaragua. That's Jalapa, Condega, and Esteli. And then we also work with tobaccos out of the DR. Well, supposedly Castro did that at the height of the uh, boom, but no one, kill, no one will go on record to say it because they just made too many cigars and they didn't have that many leaves. Um, hey, Cuba can't sue me. Uh, look, the, we have had a great time celebrating our birthday, and uh, we are thrilled that the three of you were able to join us. Uh, thank you. Uh, you, you are. St uh, we're going to have to come to you, Sam, because you're in the bunker there, and I'm just worried you're never going to leave. Uh, 
But uh, but thank you all for helping us celebrate our birthday, and thank you for your continued partnership, strategic with uh, everyone at Accutron. The products are amazing, and uh, we are thrilled to be associated with you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Accutron Show. To listen to all of our shows, visit AccutronWatch.com. To learn more about the world of Accutron, follow us on Instagram at Accutron Watch and subscribe to our podcast. From New York City, until next time, Accutron Time.